let's uh, let's uh, get some updates, uh, some new faces. Uh, well, see, so hadn't seen uh, Sergey in a little while, and, and uh, Mike's been away a little bit, so uh, changing it up. And I know that uh, that uh, Giovanni and Matteo, screen share is not quite working. Giovanni and Matteo are on um, on a vacation, so they're away. Um, so we've got a few different folks. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and uh, check out what's new. So um, for my part, um, the last couple weeks, um, we did get together with, uh, with Mike and Alex and uh, kind of rebooted the uh, muscle cell uh, subject, which is really great. Um, some notes are available here under uh, muscle cell meeting. Um, so, uh, so I put together a small uh, muscle cell optimization project tracker. Um, and so the top part, I think, kind of uh, links um, a lot of the content uh, all in one place that um, that we're you know starting with. So um, Mike has uh, generously uh, open sourced his uh, optimal neuron project um, and uh, linked to his GitHub repositories here. Um, the uh, data files are up in the Dropbox uh, link there for that. Um, the original uh, Boyle model source code that we've got also up in Dropbox, uh, the link is there. Um, and the GitHub repository for our muscle cell model under OpenWorm, uh, implemented in Neuron, um, which is, is kind of just um, a, um, uh, some stubs right now. Uh, but that's also a uh, link here. And then um, link to the Boyle paper on the muscle cell model is here as well. Um, we started to put together some basic steps for um, you know what to do on this, and um, we basically uh, kind of uh, outlined uh, you know a schedule for how to uh, get this going. Um, I think uh, so. We're we're probably going to start in earnest next week. I know that uh, Mike was wrapping some things up, and um, and so was Alex. So Alex wasn't going to be available until the twenty second, and, and Mike not until the twenty seventh. But um, we sort of scheduled some time to kind of focus on this. And the basic overview is that uh, we kind of debated back and forth how to uh, how to get going. I think what we determined is that um, the, the end goal of what we want is to have this thing implemented in NeuroML, but uh, that Mike, um, you know, Mike is really strong in, in Neuron and implementing mod, mod files. And so what we're going to do is going to start just by implementing the oil model in Neuron, and then once we like it um, to kind of backport it into NeuroML so that it can be run on things other than Neuron. And uh, I think that seems like a reasonable way to proceed. That's kind of what the steps here are outlining. Um, and um, before we get back to that, really there's basically four channels that we have to incorporate. All the parameters are listed in the paper, and, uh, and we have them in the source code. So, um, so Alex and Mike together are going to lay out the steps after having uh, put the model together in Neuron, that will um, incorporate the data files that are from that lab um, so we can get back to the model update. Any uh, questions about that? Um, comments? I have one small comment. Yep. Um, we discussed doing it in Neuron. Yep. Um, since, since, um, since I've been working on this uh, pyramidal project, and it's, uh, it's worked pretty well. And all we're dealing with is Hodgkin Huxley models. Then one possible route to that, which I'd I'd like to take, is actually using this uh, pyramidal framework. It might it actually I think it'll be a lot easier than because that will mean that no one has to use any kind of mod mod file writing at all. And it's a technical detail which we can discuss later. But that's a slightly different route into using Neuron. Okay, that's cool. That's cool too. I've been. Uh Getting more and more comfortable with uh, with Python um, in the last several weeks too, so um, that can be all right. Just so long as these things can all kind of you know flow together, and then we can eventually get back to normal. And well, the whole that that's a second advantage. Um, in, in the future, this pyramid this um, framework, this pyramidal project, will allow you to automatically just write neuroML, write your model out in neuroML. So it, it, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we would want to take this route. Cool. Sounds good. The only minor reason uh, would might be that um, you'll only be dealing with NeuroML version two, and various things like uh, Genesis will only deal with uh, NeuroML version one so far, 
uh, but it's probably not something significant that you should worry about. I mean, if you can test it on Neuron Moose, that will probably be fine for the foreseeable future. Okay. Uh, give me anything in mind. Um, all right. Uh, the second thing, um, for my part, uh, was um, another meeting on Synas position project topics. Um, actually, not sure that I've updated this, but basically, we um, we played around with Stephen Cook with the instance of um, the uh, CatMade server on Amazon. And um, we had identified some things that we needed to um, figure out to, in order to get that in order to get that working. I've sent some emails around um, to make sure that we have the that we can create the user accounts that we needed to create um, in order to get people moving on that. I've uh, sort of lagged on on getting that um, worked up, but um, but we at least um, you know have gotten pretty far down the road of of having these data sets installed and, and getting some progress on that. I need to loop back on that um, this week and, and, um, and push that forward. In parallel, though, and uh, now that I see Sergey is back, um, we still have the, the, the topics on the table of the, the algorithms that are a little bit farther down, um, you know, in terms of transformations of the uh, XYZ coordinate positions into NORML. And if uh, you want to kind of get back to that as well, um, I think that would also help us move this forward on the other side. Because the two pieces of this, of course, are getting volunteers to mark synapses on you know data sets that uh, where they haven't been marked yet, and also um, uh, you know being able to algorithmically transform that into and and, and combine that with our NeuroML um, connectome. Um, I should also say uh, along the way is that um, that uh, Stephen Cook, who we've been working with, um, and who's been extremely helpful uh, at the Emmons Lab. Has uh, completed a com uh, a re uh, a reworking of the synapses of the original uh, on the original white data set, um, and he actually comes up with some differences from the latest connectome that we have uh, that we got off of uh, Wormbase. So um, so that's interesting, and um, it'll be interesting to compare perhaps both sets uh, to each other down the road. Um, and so he continues to be extremely helpful. With that, they're basically going to be working up a publication on that. But the more of these papers that are out there now that are defining the connectome, so it's not just like an n of one, um, I think are only helpful the project. So, mm -hmm. uh, yep. Questions, comments. Okay. So um, uh, I know that Gleb has uh, moved to Boston from the Bay Area since the last time. Uh, we saw him, so uh, he, is, he may not be available for updates for a while as well. Um, so let's uh, past. Uh, let's go to Porg. Porg, uh, what's new? Um, not a terrible, terribly large amount. Um, I'd been in the uh, at the Combine meeting in uh, oh. Toronto for the last week, which is the forum for. Uh, standardization languages like SPML and CellML to get together and have just one uh, meeting where they all get together and talk about standards. So I was presenting uh, some of NeuroML there and the Open Source Brain project, and that went down reasonably well. I uh, mentioned OpenWorm also, um, but it was mainly about uh, systems biology standards like uh, SPML. Um, but people are aware of various things now happening with it this project and others. Yeah, anything else interesting in that in that meeting? Um, did anybody talk about the like that car model? Um, they did, that actually. Model. That was one of the introductory slides. Um, you know Nicolas <laughs> Lenouvert? Yeah. He presented this uh, in his opening introduction and with the big words, game changer across it. Uh, <laughs> basically because um, this was a high-profile publication. He was very impressed it was in Cell, and uh, they're also not as impressed with the fact that they managed to do all of this without using any of these standards. So um, there was talk at the meeting of, I mean, and it was reasonable, obviously, that if it's basic research that you don't necessarily put it into standards initially, but um, a, lot, a number of people had suggested um, try to sit down with this model. Uh, the MATLAB for it all is available and convert 
parts of it into standardized formats, other parts that couldn't be converted to ask why and try to develop uh, a framework, an open framework that people can produce uh, similar cell models in using standard formats. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So there was a lot of talk about that. That's good. There uh, was, yeah. I mean, it's seen as a significant development in the field and obviously for standardization uh, you need to be able to cover these kind of significant uh, computational biology modeling projects and um, it's a potential thing that people are even talking about getting funding specifically for converting various parts into SBML and other standards. Okay. Cool. So. Um, all right. Anything else? Um, not really anything else that springs to mind at the moment. Um, not since last meeting, though. No. Okay, I think I actually had a question for you. Uh, I'm look it up. Um, right, okay. So, um, the last, when was the last time, as far as you know, that we actually wrote out the entire uh, NeuroML from the NeuroConstruct project? Um, and um, is, that, is that up somewhere? Um, I sort of I lost track. I don't know if it is. Um, it's fairly straightforward to generate the cell positions in NeuroML. Their algorithm for generating the 10,000 plus uh, connections based on the uh, the Excel spreadsheet is implemented, but it's very slow unless you set the maximum allowed distance between synapses to something like 50 microns. So, which means that the connections can potentially be made across the, if you think about it, across the diameter of the um, worm's body. So it's not necessarily always the very closest locations. It's um, it can be quite significantly long. So I mean, you can reduce that to a certain extent, but it takes much longer to generate. So it's been on my to-do list for a while to actually try to implement something a bit more efficient to generate these more efficiently and if there are five connections between two individual neurons, that it will find locations which are physically as close as possible. Um, I, I dropped out a little bit in the middle there. Uh, okay, well, basic, yeah, basically, so it will, if you have a, a table saying, okay, there are five connections between these two cells, three connections between these two cells, it will generate all of those now, but they won't be the most efficient or closest connections. Right. right. That's um, okay. Yeah. So yeah. Um, just because um, I'm actually going to be speaking a little bit later today on a sort of a kind of a warm-up for the INCF uh, poster, um, I'm yes. running a little bit on the, on the Connectome. Um, do you think you could just do a run of, the, of that and without the NeuroML somewhere? Is it easy-ish to do? It should be easy. Um, it's about 14 Fifteen meg, as far as the last time I checked, um, but it should be possible to put it up someplace. Okay, I would really appreciate it if you do get a chance in the next you know, day or two. Okay, um, you can just do that and just throw it in the Dropbox and uh, let me know um, if that's yeah. the easiest thing. Or you can, or we can put it up on GitHub if that makes sense too. Um, yeah, I'll so. probably put it in the Dropbox. I mean, there's probably an older version of it there, so. Um, okay. uh, Okay. Okay. Awesome. And then also the we created the neuron project, um, which I think in in NeuroConstruct doesn't obligatorily go through the NeuroML generation step, right? Like you can create a neuron project from the NeuroConstruct data model without going through Neuro NeuroML, or or am I wrong? Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's the normal way. You'd go from the NeuroML project to Neuro Neuro Neuron or Luce or whatever without necessarily generating NeuroML. Okay. Well, that one, um, that one's sort of lower priority, but I, I do want to also go back to that one, and um, because I know we have done that, I just kind of want to collect all these things and be able to point people to them online so they can play with them. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely will be a lot easier with this uh, libneuroml to, and I mean, in an ideal scenario, uh, neuroconstruct would just generate pure neuroml, give it to a Python script to load up, 
and that can be the same process for any given simulator and LibNeuroML will definitely help enable that. Okay, awesome. Yep. Sweet. All right. Uh, let's see. So that's awesome. Combined meeting, uh, car model was described as game changer. And we'll uh, have a look at exporting for this scratch. And then there was this Python script for uploading to CSV files last time. Um, that's awesome. So. Yeah, actually, is there? You had said you were speaking to Stephen Cook. Um, yes. There, there isn't any new dump of the SQL database. No, no. Um, the latest dump. Yeah, the latest dump that we we got we had a few rounds of this right, and um, and the latest dump is still the one that's on um, you know in Dropbox. So I can look for that. OK. No, I think I, tr I tried the latest one that actually um, had a reasonable amount of data. So I mean, the, the basic scripts are there. But I mean, once there's better data, once there's a more complete dump, then I can try again and uh, pull it out in Python. And I mean, f on the basis of that, uh, try to uh, put it into another Excel spreadsheet or put it directly into NeuroConstruct and so on. OK. I'll make a note to work on the Okay. Okay. Um, so, Mike, uh, I actually just uh, just now here I linked to your blog post, uh, your latest blog post here on Pyramidal. So, do you want to mm -hmm. tell everybody uh, what that means and uh, what the significance of it all is? Uh, yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> I've been working on this project, um, which basically is a Python library and API, and API uh, the intention of which is to allow you to build to specify simulation description simulation of simulations of neurons and to run these simulations using any simulator which the API supports so there's currently two there's moose and neuron they're the two really big simulators of um, multi-compartmental models of neurons um, so the project has now reached a stage where if you're dealing with um, Hodgkin-Huxley type models, Hodgkin-Huxley channels, and single compartmental and single compartment neurons, then you can run these simulations pretty much so, so far heavily involved with. So um, yeah. I think uh, I think it's it's still at it's still at pretty much at an alpha stage right now. It doesn't it doesn't fully support multi-compartmental modeling, for instance. But although this is something which will be added uh, in the very near future, hopefully in the coming days, because it's just a few small bugs. But uh, I'm pretty hopeful that this can really be used with a, a project like OpenWorm, because if we can specify our one model in one way and then just run it on any simulator which we choose and once maybe once um, once we have our own simulator um, we can also get this pyramidal project to talk to that I think that would be just pretty fantastic so the syntax is pretty straightforward pretty easy to understand and if you want to have a look at it play around with it see if you can run some simple simulations based on the examples on, on on the uh, in the documentation, that'd be great if you could give me any feedback. Awesome. So, um, is this does this depend on LibNeuroML or is it? Um, it is it does. It does. It does completely depend on LibNeuroML. So the object model, things like um, compartments, how big they are, how they're connected together, that's entirely provided by LibNeuroML. And what Pyramidal does, it essentially acts as a as a kind of not quite a wrapper, but let, let's let's call it a wrapper. What it what it essentially does is gets you to write write your model in in a very un easy to understand um, easy to understand uh, Python script, which uses which uses libneuroml for things like um, yeah, like a morphology and Hodgkin Huxley channel descriptions and so on. And then what Pyramidal does is it talks to simulators and specifies that model in, in a language which the simulator will understand. 
So right now it supports two simulators. So you, so you can do the exact same simulation in both Neuron and Moose. Specify it in this one easy to write uh, model description. Um, yeah, and it does depend on it does depend on LibNeuronML. It's also uh, not fully right now, but because I haven't had time to to uh, fully implement everything, but um, it also obviously since it's using LibNeuronML lets you do things like load a morphology with all the ion channel descriptions from a LibNeuronML file, and then so and then run a simulation on that. So hopefully, in the coming in the next week or two. What you'll be able to do is get a um, NeuroML version two specified morphology with Hodgkin Hoxin channels in there and just all the biophysics, everything specified. Load that from a NeuroML file. Uh, specify it with pyramidal what kind of simulation you want to run. Say you want to inject a current or put some kind of voltage clamp or some something like that, and just hit run and run the simulation, which which I I think will be a pretty pretty neat step because there's no no easy way to do that right now. Awesome. What's the relationship today with um, mine? So um, the intention, oh, we haven't fully decided on this, but what we'll probably do once it's at a nice, uh, in sort of really releasable stage, is make it part of Pine. Although that's not, that's what I'd like to do. That's quite possibly the route we'll take, though it's not certain. I mean, I should point out as well, Andrew Davison is uh, one of the guys uh, supervising you for the project. So, I mean, Andrew's been on board with all of the kind of um, discussions about this. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like he's going to show up one day and try to integrate this with Pine. I mean, Andrew is, uh, has been part of this process for how all of these pieces fit together. So yep. it'll, that'll make it easier when it does come time to uh, put it into um, Pine. I think his priority, though, at the moment is to keep the core of Pine as stable as possible, and something like this is still a bit experimental, so it'll probably live as a separate project for the time being. Yeah. But with so it needs, it needs me to implement features which I know need to be implemented. It then needs a lot of user testing, and then maybe we can integrate it into Pine. But it's designed to be similar to Pine in the ways it can be similar to Pine from the start. Okay. So, I mean, as far as user are concerned, they'll just see XML, which is in uh, NeuroML format. They'll see a bunch of uh, Python scripts they have to uh, call, which are well, just Python scripts, but uh, they'll be common among multiple simulators. So if a simulator does support a feature like multi-compartmental cells, you can use a subset of that language. Um, if it just does point neurons, you might only be able to use nest or something. but. Uh, I mean, from the user's point of view, it's just Python and XML options for specifying their models. Got it. So in my, in my view, it's kind of a natural progression in many ways from NeuroML. So NeuroML is excellent for specifying, uh, specifying a model, uh, just a complete sort of cell description. Um, what you also need to specify is a simulation description, and uh, you need a way to, to talk to different simulators, and that just aids interoper interoperability. And so, in many ways, I think it's, the project is kind of a natural progression. Um, yeah, so that's what it is. Nice. Do uh, do try it out if you have any interest at all in these kind of simulations. There's some the document the documentation I think is pretty is pretty straightforward. So it's worth okay. worth a shot. Excellent. Okay, sounds good. Uh, shall we turn to our friends in Siberia? Andre, how's it going? Oh, okay, I'll try to um, tell what I was doing um, two recent weeks. Um, first of all, um, I have um, done short uh, video um, of uh, most recent uh, PCI SPH uh, in Dropbox. Uh, I have sent uh, the link to chat window. Um, very okay. short. Um, so first of all, um, I have um, 
improved uh, visualization with um, well, the pressure is uh, displayed uh, with a color. Uh, dark blue is um, oh, no pressure, the density, uh, liquid density. Uh, dark blue is um, a resting density, which, it, which should be <laughs> everywhere if uh, everything uh, works absolutely correctly. And um, for example, uh, the green color is 1% uh, deviation uh, from rest density. Uh, yellow is 2% and red uh, is 3%. Uh, as we remember from uh, Soren Zarer's uh, dissertation, uh, she tells that uh, they reach during the simulation at every step um, not more than 2% of this uh, deviation in density um, after three steps of um, PCI-SPH um, prediction, uh, prediction correction steps um, but well as we can see after visualization that we have um, 3% or even more. Uh, of course, I uh, have um, all this data um, in a uh, text file uh, dur uh, which is uh, generated during program's work um, and um, during the long simulation I have noticed even 13 or 14 percent of this error. Well, it depends from time step and um, many other things. Mm. But well, this is quite um, important for um, stability of the system. Um, I have tried uh, very long uh, runs with, for example, 20 hundred thousands uh, of runs. Uh, sometimes mm, it's okay, and sometimes it causes uh, errors um, because of mm, different things. So, uh, I focused on investigation of this density, how it behaves, what factors um, influence this, and how we can improve it. Um, so this um, I mentioned two percent um, were not uh, so easy um, achievable as it seemed uh, before, uh, and I still cannot um, tell it. I'm completely satisfied with what's going on, but it's much better than at the beginning, and we can see visually uh, what is uh, happening. But well, if we reduce uh, the time step, we get better results but we get slower um, work uh, on the program, which is um, quite sad, because <laughs> we need fast uh, performance. Um, I'm not sure how to solve it right now, but I will think in this direction. Um, well, and second one, uh, we were working with uh, Eugene there um, about uh, surface tension, and we have already a working prototype. Well, it also has some um, things which look unnatural, but in general, um, detection of surface uh, particles uh, is already working, and well, the force is also being created, a surface tension force, and um, the final form of a um, piece of liquid. Um, becomes uh, um, a flat drop, um, which is uh, not um, distributed uniformly over the bottom of uh, the simulation box, but it's um, located somewhere uh, in the center, and it's uh, oval or uh, round, so looks very nice. Um, when we will fix uh, minor um, bugs which still exist, um, I will also prepare yeah, a movie, which um, will be quite good looking, I hope. And well, Elastic Matter is still under construction, 
because this um, tasks um, larger in priority up to my understanding. So that's, that's all. So did everybody see the um, everybody see these movies by the way? Um, and you guys see what's going? You guys see the uh, the thing that's got uh, Andre worried? I don't think. Um, um, no, I don't think so. Okay, let me show you. Cause I've been I've been playing it over and over again here, and it's actually pretty interesting. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, so with uh, VLC, I think I can. The other one I was able to Windows. I'm able to speed this up so that you can actually see the effect. Let's see. Playback. Okay, yeah. So if I speed this up to like 16x, so what he's done is he's made it so that the color change here is related to the amount of, I guess, pressure that any single particle is experiencing. Uh, density. The Not density. pressure, density. But of course they are um, connected um, with each other, and one is calculated from another. Uh, but it's density. Yeah. So basically, I think if I understand correctly, go back and play. Oh, is that really 32 times? I think that really is 38. Okay. Anyway, so this all seems good, right? Like they're all sort of all the particles are kind of coming together. But I think uh, if I understand correctly, so it hits this thing, okay, and then sort of the density, I guess, of all these particles kind of adds up over here. And there's this extra sort of blurb <laughs> that are causing these extra things to, to spit up here. If you sort of stare at how the density kind of crops up here, it kind of seems like all the particles are kind of bouncing against each other. Is that kind of what you're worried about? Yes, that's right. So it's some kind of um, is that, waves is that, of pressure propagating very fast. Mm. Is that okay. definitely not like what happens? Is it, is it something you know to be scientifically wrong? Andre, is that something you know that, that, that uh, is definitely wrong? Mm, well, I'm worried about um, the stability of um, this uh, simulation because um, um, this uh, error, which is uh, seen in uh, uh, red color, um, that the deviation from normal um, rest density, um, this is a quite um, serious problem because um, it can cause um, extremely high uh, velocities of um, some particles which can fly out of um, simulation volume and then uh, their um, indexes uh, recalculated after each step will be out of um, memory and it can crash all the application and um, by the way uh, the correct um, uh, physics uh, will be when this um, pressure, well, this pressure is um, very connected with um, incompressibility of the fluid. If there are significant changes in density, then it means that we still have uh, some compressibility. Uh, that's why so I'm worried about, about this. Yeah, so under so I mean, one question is, I mean, didn't you play around a little bit with implementing surface tension? And is it possible that surface tension could hold these particles in and kind of resist this, uh, this sort of this blurb of, uh, you know, this all, all these particles kind of getting crunched together and then moving out? Is, it, is that something that could help? Surface tension will uh, significantly improve um, the processes which uh, take place uh, on the surface. Uh, there will be no uh, separate particles running um, above uh, the main volume of liquid and so on, but um, 
the processes which take place in the main volume of a liquid will not be much affected by this. So it's um, a standalone problem which doesn't uh, depend uh, from surface tension. Yeah. Um, well, I have noticed that um, when the time step is larger than uh, in this simulation, um, the problem is uh, significantly more serious. So in this um, demo, it's it's quite um, it's quite well uh, comparing to the um, previous variants. Yeah. So it's PCI is pH, but it's working with uh, some. Well, it's not perfect. Yeah. So, as I'm, I'm still trying to understand the exact nature of the problem. So the problem is that you get these particles at a very high velocity, and the velocity is so high that by the time the next time step comes about, that they are actually outside the simulation volume and they just disappear. Mm, this is maybe not the reason, but um, the um, well, something which happens uh, because of. Um, well, I, I'll try to <laughs> take the diction and find correct words to formulate it. Um, well, there is uh, a cause uh, and cause and uh, consequence. Um, so. Uh, velocity uh, is the consequence, and um, the initial um, problem is that the prediction correction algorithm um, does not completely converge uh, after a small time, a small number of steps. Um, the article which describes this algorithm um, doesn't mention all the deta details of the simulation. Uh, that's why we implemented it mm, somehow, as it uh, seemed uh, logically and correctly, but, well, maybe it works um, at some other uh, variations of mm, parameters. Um, well. So, um, in my opinion, uh, the correct correct work of PCI-SPH um, is a result of a very fine tuning of um, a number of parameters which are in the simulation. Um, and uh, we have successfully tuned some of them and maybe we are still missing something quite important. Well, I have some um, suggestions about what can it be, but I have to check do you mean physical parameters or parameters like time step and so forth? Uh, for example, uh, there is um, one uh, factor which should be uh, pre-computed uh, at start of um, simulation. Um, it uh, it is connected with um, well statistically average uh, particle um, neighborhood and. Um, well, it's calculated over the smoothing uh, kernel uh, for a natural uh, neighborhood of the particle. And, um, well, people ordinarily uh, take some regular uh, structure, um, take um, a number of particles uh, composing this structure uh, within uh, a support radius smoothing radius, uh, and then um, calculate that value um, taking into account all these uh, particles. Um, but this initial configuration uh, may be generated um, uh, slightly different, uh, and well, this um, factor um, is uh, proportional to well, a coefficient between uh, density and pressure. So that's why maybe we don't have um, stable convergence of the algorithm uh, if we uh, overestimate or underestimate it uh, due to 
um, not completely correct initial configuration of the particles, for example, like this. So I'd like to um, check uh, such things, uh, the influence on the stability of the algorithm. Um, and well, all my previous uh, actions in this direction were quite successfully. Uh, the simulation became better and more stable. Um, I plan to finish this work and uh, get it as good as it was described in the um, article telling us about it. So we, we would prefer to have <laughs> an excellent, a perfect <laughs> simulation. So I, I feel like what I want to do here is is to wrap up, I mean, um, to, to package up what you've done so far. And I mean, these movies, I mean, you've obviously implemented the algorithm. You obviously have demos that don't completely blow up um, under these conditions that we have here. So um, you've done a lot. I'm, I'm, what I'm tempted to want to do is kind of package what we've got and you know, put the latest version of the source up online, put the videos up online, create a blog post that just kind of says like where we are and kind of what the challenges are right now, send it out to the mailing list, and then maybe even you know, send it out to some of the other folks that we know are PCI SPH people including, you know, maybe going back to Barbara Solenthaler, the original author, and just say, look, this is where we're at, you know, this is how we've modified what's happening, this is what we still see, um, you know, our, our problems are A, B, C, D, um, you know, if anybody can think of a way to address them, um, we'd love to, we'd love to hear it, otherwise, you know, obviously we're just going to keep working on it, but um, I don't know, what do you think, Andre, do you think that would be helpful at this point? Yeah, sure. It's um, uh, very nice to um, um, write down all which is done. Um, first, uh, first of all, to remember <laughs> after a half of a year or a longer time. Uh, yes, of course, to share um, this experience with our team and maybe other people who are interested because uh, PCSPH, OpenCL, uh, working uh, free source code is uh, very rare. Uh, in our time, <laughs> yeah, people right. can like it very much, mm, and it took about half a year for us to implement all this. So it was yeah, the other, the, I mean, the other thing I think is like you know we may have to consider some kind of other you know way to hack this so that you know if there's you know particles that just start going at a crazy velocity, maybe there maybe we consider them to have sublimated. And we just delete them, you know, from memory, or I, I don't know. I mean, if if their velocity, I mean, maybe that's going to cause other trouble. But I'm I'm wondering if there's some other kind of uh, you know out of the box solution here that uh, that might be appropriate. So anyway, but so we, we we can talk about that. So I think that the steps then for that, and I'll just uh, I'll just go ahead and turn this into an email with you guys now. So um, either. You know, committing to the master branch for the PCI SPH, or um, you know, or another branch, right? Like a secondary branch or something under the PCI SPH. If uh, you and Sergey can can get that up there, um, then what I'll do is I'll take the videos and um, I'll put I'll turn them into YouTube YouTubeable videos, and then um, I'll send around a draft of um, a blog post. That would just kind of explain, like, okay, here's the code, here's the movies, here's what we see. It's not working. Uh, you know, here's you know point ABC as to what could be improved. We're going to keep working, but if anybody has any clever ideas, we welcome that. Okay. 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 It would be very good as well if um, you could maybe put a few comments in the README even in the short term, about uh, the systems you've used to build it and so on. Uh, as I say, which version of, uh, um, if it was visual, C++ and so on, uh, so that at least some of the people in the Open Worm project can try to reproduce the and build it themselves. OK, no problem. Right. I'll, I'll, go, I'll be glad to. Great. I'll be happy to try that out. Awesome, awesome. Very good. Yep. We don't want you to uh, feel like you're the only one who can who can help on this, Andre. Hopefully, that's another 
other brains to, to think as well. As well. Um, but um, you know, I, I still think this is the right, uh, you know, the right algorithm, the right strategy. I think we just have to get the practical problem nailed, and uh, you know, we're all eager to to get the next point on this. So. All right, but uh, thank you for making those movies, and uh, I think it makes it very clear kind of where you're at and um, what we can do to move forward. So that's very helpful. Okay. Um, so Sergey, welcome back from, uh, from camp. Um, you're probably just kind of getting back into things. Uh, I, I brought up the note here from last time. Um, uh, from last time we chatted about, so that was uh, getting support for rotation of the camera, the WebGL camera uh, working, um, and having that WebGL test with random motion of the particles. Um, I suppose that's all that's new. Is there anything else that's, that's new with you? Um, no, I think it's a it's, uh, last <laughs> update. Okay. So, is there uh, is there anything that you uh, will be taking up here in the next uh, couple of weeks? Uh, no, uh, I think uh, I won't work with uh, elastic matter for PC for SPH. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm done. Some works. I'm now can calculate. Elastic force, but uh, there are problem with integration. Uh, and uh, maybe I want to work uh, on with 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 near metal, maybe as with synopsis. <laughs> okay. And okay. all right. Good. Ah, yeah. I I I won't. Uh, I need to do Eclipse Juno uh, distributive for Windows. Eclipse <laughs> Juno, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've been playing more and more and more with, um, with everybody's uh, you know, understanding with, with the cloud computing stuff, and uh, in particular, um, kind of becoming addicted to IPython Notebook lately, and, um, and also using uh, Fabric and Boto as ways of launching uh, pre-configured Amazon instances and thinking that this is going to be a powerful way to distribute many of these different uh, pieces and parts where, you know, basically once the installation instructions become much more than like pip install whatever, and it's like, oh, modify this configuration file and use the GUI to do X, Y, and Z, and oh, it's, by the way, it's different on three different architectures. It just starts to it's just the, the weight I think of uh, of this starts to, to get too much. So um, so anyway, I'm playing more with it, and I've I've got now some Fabric scripts that will um, you know, launch an AWS instance and um, can log on remotely and run and execute commands on there. Um, so I'm getting better and better at this. Um, I don't have a lot to show for it quite yet, um, but. Um, but I mean, I've I've gone so far as in, you know installing a desktop. I think I mentioned this last time. You know, installing a GUI, la you know, on it and uh, getting Eclipse on, up and running. Um, so my hope is that you know we can have prepackaged distribution. I know Giovanni last time was very skeptical that uh, anybody would ever use this, and, but uh, I think in a shorter term um, it would be would be useful. Also, the Fabric script um, can be used uh, can be you know modified to not just work on Amazon, but also to, to you know work on a local Ubuntu setup. So um, you know, it could also be run to, uh, to have somebody configure their own development environment locally, which other people would like to. So anyway, um, that's uh, so uh, so good that we'll get the you know Eclipse Juno thing you know s set out there. I think it's important moving, and uh, I'll be my part as well. Okay, last thing uh, updates uh, for me. I, I also. Um, uh, I have a draft of a the presentation I'm doing a little bit later, which I linked up at the top here. Uh, ooh, yeah. uh, I, I linked it up at the top of the document, so um, I'm still working on those slides, but uh, there's a couple new slides in there from before, and um, just basically talking about what we've done with the, with the 
you'll see that improve here in the next uh, hour or so as I get it. Uh, hey, Tim. Uh oh, we can't hear you, Tim. We've gone all the way around to our uh, to our updates, and and we're about ready to. Uh, I think break for this time, but uh, Tim, if you have any updates, and we can we can get the audio working. Okay. Um, Are you in chat, Tim? Yeah. Let's see. Good question. Okay. No, Tim. All right, so uh, let's uh, let's break early this time. Then um, we'll review the um, you know, we'll review the epics again next time. I think uh, you know, folks being away, um, there's uh, different pieces going on. But I think everything that everybody's doing is still under the context of you know where we had been going. Um, I'll also be putting together um, putting together a poster for uh, that is based on the Connect Home stuff for Munich. Um, that will also be available through. Uh, you know the, the Google Share folder, and I'd love to get your feedback on that once uh, you know once we've got a draft. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, the other. Th yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, I mean, if you have any specific questions or uh, want to email me directly on that for neuroml related stuff, please do. Okay, great. Um, right. The other thing is, um, just before the meeting, I sent out a um, I sent out a schedule once poll. Uh, everybody here should receive it. Plus, folks not not on. Uh, and that's uh, so. There's several different things that we wanted to talk about. Uh, we didn't get scheduled in the last couple of weeks. Dealing with publication, dealing with Palash's paper, um, and also more importantly, um, this meeting. I can't make it next week, so I'm looking for another time slot. Uh, maybe I can just with you all here right now, just to see if um, if uh, this same time, but on the sixth, um, on 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 uh, September sixth. Uh, instead of September 5th, the Thursday, uh, instead of the Wednesday, um, would that would that work? That's Did anybody fine. Not, anybody not make that? that? Um, I possibly might not be able um, that week. Uh, Mateo is starting in the lab here, and Robert Cannon and uh, some other people are going to be around. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I. Uh, I can't commit at the moment, but uh, we'll try if that is okay. set up. OK. Everybody else seems to be OK? OK, I'm, I'm going to tentatively move it then. Um, if, uh, if a lot of people can't make it, we'll, we'll change it. I'll actually be in New York City. Uh, so I'll be doing a bit of a road in New York, uh, a little bit closer to you all. So uh, yeah, OK, great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we are chugging along. Um, Mike, good to have you back. Sergey, good to have you back. Um, and um, I think uh, we'll have even more interesting stuff next time. Yep, and I'm looking forward to next week on the muscle cell stuff we're going to be working on. Cool. All right. Cool. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Shorter meeting okay. today. Bye bye. 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 bye.